So it is my uh, true pleasure and honor to welcome Katie Milkman uh, from uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the uh, James Dinan professor. And, uh, you know, Katie is one of the most creative um, and impactful behavioral scientists out there today, I think. Um, she hosts the Choiceology podcast, Charles Schwab's Choiceology podcast, uh, which focuses on behavioral economics. She's the former president of the International Society for Judgment and Decision Making. She's also the co-founder, co-director of the Behavior Change for Good initiative, which as you uh, will see today, and, and if you are aware of her work, is a main theme that runs throughout her work. How can we nudge for good? How can we think about uh, behavior change for good? Um, she's, a, uh, she's won tons of awards, and I won't go through them all, but I will mention, uh, and, and I, I was very pleased to see uh, that she has uh, just recently won an award from the Thinkers 50 and has been uh, inducted into the top 50 management thinkers in the world. Uh, that was fantastic. And today she's going to talk about, and she's been a frequent guest with us uh, at the conference on digital experimentation because a lot of her work is experimental and I just love hearing her talks. And so I think you're in for a real treat today. Today, she's gonna talk about uh, mega studies and how they improve the impact of applied behavioral science. I think she's gonna combine a couple of different uh, studies. This is work that I think is just absolutely fantastic. When I read the paper, the original paper, the, the first big one, um, uh, I was really blown away. And I think it's, it's such an interesting topic. So Katie, uh, just to remind everybody of the ground rules, please uh, turn off your videos. Katie, welcome. It's great to have you. I'll also turn off my video and I'll just interrupt you with questions if they seem pressing and relevant and timely, and then we can have a discussion afterwards. So welcome. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you for that incredibly lovely introduction. Uh, you left out the key fact, which is that <laughs> Um, we were inducted together into the Thinkers 50 <laughs> list this week. So this is our second time hanging out online. Um, yes, indeed. Very exciting. True pleasure. <laughs> the honor is all mine. Um, okay, so I am really excited to share this work with you. For, for those of you who've been to Code this year or last year, you will see some, some familiar data because what I, I brought is sort of an overview of this new type of work that um, I've been doing in, in partnerships sort or of pioneering this methodology with Angela Duckworth and uh, a huge team of people at the Behavior Change for Good Initiative. And I'm gonna tell you about multiple studies and try to make an argument or a case for a, a little bit of a different way of doing research. So let me share my slides. And I should also say, I am delighted to be interrupted throughout, I get very sick hearing the sound of my own voice. So please don't hesitate to interrupt me. And I think I can see the chat all right, but if you just unmute, that's probably even better. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the motivation for a different way of doing applied behavioral science, um, for me at least came from the rise of influence of this field on um, public policy. And in particular, for those of you who are familiar with sort of the nudge movement with the publication um, of the book Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein came this huge growth in interest in um, using behavioral science to improve the function of government. Uh, and this is actually a now outdated map of the roughly 200 behavioral insights teams that sprung up in governments around the world over the last roughly decade, now almost 15 years, um, trying to use insights from, from our work to do everything from nudge people to pay their taxes, to help ensure that they have financial security and retirement, um, to getting people to take their vaccines, something I'll talk about a bit today. So there's this giant demand, there's this giant enthusiasm for using these new tools to change outcomes and policy relevant domains. But there is, I would say, some challenge when it comes to finding great evidence. And I think hopefully it's an uncontentious statement to say that ideally policy advice would be based on field experiments, sort of the gold standard, right, of, of proving that something, um, some insight from behavioral science has, has validity in a uh, policy relevant setting, and you use a randomized controlled trial to test a hypothesis so you know you can make a causal inference. 
but running field experiments turns out to require just gigantic fixed costs to, to prove an idea and it's slow. And um, even when we have field studies to look at, looking at effect sizes, which is really critical to policy evaluation, right? To understand like, well, what, you know, what's the bang I'm gonna get for my buck in this case? How much value am I gonna create? Trying to do that requires making apples to oranges comparisons, just in one domain where we actually have probably more evidence than almost any other on the power of behavioral science, which is encouraging retirement savings. Some of the most important studies have been done in wildly different populations, like adults in um, adult Danes versus adult Californians and, and trying and different time periods, really different structures that they're facing. Um, you know, one study looking at things like how does a default change savings decisions, another matching, we, I give you a dollar for every dollar you put in and you can see, okay, both work, but which really works better? It's hard to know. Um, and then another challenge, I think, when it comes to policy advice is the replication crisis, which uh, means that we don't always know which behavioral insights are robust, which are externally valid. Um, there's a file drawer problem where even if something has been run in the field, there's not often incentives to publish the results if they're null. And that can lead to lots of resources being expended where you know different groups try to go test a hypothesis and they don't even know that it's already been uh, it's already failed to replicate in the field. So those are all challenges that I think can partially be at least addressed through this new methodology of, of the mega study that I'm going to talk about. Okay, so the solution that I'm very excited about and we'll show you several demos of today is a very large field experiment in which many smaller sub experiments are run synchronously with the same dependent variable. So instead of testing a single hypothesis with a single research team that wants to say increase retirement savings, um, dozens may come together and each test their hypotheses in parallel in the same um, setting with the same population. So some benefits of this approach that are hopefully sort of fairly uh, clear. One is comparability of results across studies, right? Now we can do those cost benefit analyses that I was complaining are difficult if you've got Danes on the one hand and Californians on the other. We've got apples to apples comparisons. Um, so we can say like, okay, this is the best performer. This is the best, most cost effective. Um, it also can reduce the fixed costs um, of, of the work by uh, having a single organizing sort of central organizer deal with that and create low marginal costs for individual scientists. Um, of doing this kind of work. It also can reduce the risk of learning nothing useful from a field study and eliminate the file drawer problem. Because if you um, launch a very large mega study like this, you can publish the results um, all as a package and there will be some that are positive and some that are null or negative. Uh, but that, that full body of evidence will be of interest to the scientific community and there's an incentive to get it out there. So um, I think that's a really useful aspect of this too. It can be run as a tournament with interdisciplinary teams, which is something I love. So often, right, you have an economist and, and they have a hypothesis. I, I work in a field that's at the intersection between economics and psychology. So you'll have an economist and they want to publish in the quarterly journal of economics. That's the only place. And so talking to psychologists and sharing ideas isn't going to work for them because maybe the psychologist wants to publish only in psychological science. And, and so they have this these competing interests. Well, if you run a mega study, both could test their own hypotheses in the same playground, if you will, they can each publish their own individual study about their theory in their preferred journal. But as a part of this mega study, at least there will be some cross pollination of ideas, they'll see what the other person was doing and, and learning about in this um, same context. Um, I will also say something I'm very excited about, but we have yet to prove the value of, but it seems theoretically like it should be a, a great value add is um, the feasibility of behavioral phenotyping. And this is a term sort of borrowing from the um, behavioral medicine literature, which is like basically looking for heterogeneous treatment effects, trying to figure out what works best for whom, how can we tailor if we test, you know, dozens of ideas, it should be more feasible to say for this specific subpopulation, actually, this is the best approach, but for this other subpopulation, this is the best approach. I will say we've, we've tried to do some work with this and, and so far the value add has been small, but it may be the context where we've done our work. And I think there is potential in future mega studies to see more benefit from this. Um, okay, finally, just acceleration. This really is going to move scientific discovery forward relative to the usual way we do this one, one study at a time. Okay, so I also just want to point out that this is not like 
a revolutionary idea that comes out of the blue. There's huge, re, you know, past traditions that we're building on and suggesting doing this kind of work. Um, one particularly useful model, I think that's quite similar, um, revolutioned AI, revolutionized the field of AI uh, a little over a decade ago, and that was the use of the common task framework, right? So researchers would agree to sort of compete on the same problem uh, with the same constraints and using the same data set with total transparency. So, right, my image recognition algorithm and yours, we run them both on the exact same database and we validate them the same way and we can compare in an apples to apples way and say like, which, which is outperforming. Um, so that's been a really big benefit for AI. And I think this is sort of a similar idea for applied behavioral science. I mean, of course, there have been scientific tournaments for a very long time as well. And, and there have been big research studies that tested more than one idea at once, but not normally in this specific way. And tournaments don't typically involve random assignment. So if you, we're sort of like pu pulling from all these different traditions to say, hey, let, you know, let's try this approach in um, behavioral science. Okay, so the first study that we uh, launched was using this model was with 24 hour fitness. And I'm going to talk briefly about that. And then hopefully I'll have time also to tell you a little bit about two studies we've done during the pandemic um, with the goal of encouraging vaccination, one in partnership with Walmart pharmacies and one in partnership with two large health systems in the um, mid Middle East, uh, Middle East, mid Atlantic region um, of the US. This paper actually is coming out at Nature uh, next Wednesday, because, you know, if you have a an exciting result to release. Perfect timing is the day before Thanksgiving. So we're very excited about that. Um, I'm joking about the perfect timing, but I'm very excited that the paper is coming out and hopefully people will read it the following week. Um, okay, so this mega study was trying to encourage people to exercise more regularly. It was in partnership with this large gym chain. And uh, you know, you've seen a talk before, so I'm not sure I needed to give you this overview, but I'm gonna briefly talk about the rationale, methods, results, prediction, accuracy, which is something that I think is kind of interesting. We can see, can people anticipate what will perform well in one of these mega studies? Um, I'll conclude and then I'll pivot to telling you a little bit um, about these studies in vaccination. So the first question that might come to your mind as it often does when I present this is like the first mega study we ever ran is why physical activity? Is that the most pressing policy problem? I've been talking about retirement savings, for instance, and um, you could think about so many different challenges we face as a society. So sometimes I'm given grief about choosing this one, but I actually think it is a pretty policy relevant uh, activity and we underappreciate the importance of it. Only about half of Americans get as much exercise as they should. And it's magical. It does all sorts of great things for your health and your um, mental um, health in particular. And actually 9% of premature global mortality is attributable to insufficient physical activity. So I think it is a decent dependent variable, but I will also just note that a he, huge part of the reason we chose this outcome for our first study is that we can objectively measure high frequency decisions. And it's often been studied before in the context of trying to study behavior change longitudinally. Um, a lot of habit research in this setting. It's sort of like the fruit fly um, for behavioral science researchers who care about uh, changing behavior over time. So what we did in this study is we had 30 different scientists who came together to be part of this project and they designed 20 different individually pre-registered research studies. So each like in its own bubble. So that could be published as its own paper. Um, and then they, those had a total of 53 different experimental treatments in order to test their hypotheses. And uh, I should also note, we had a 54th condition, which was a placebo control condition. In that condition, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about how people enrolled in the mega study, but in that placebo control condition, basically people enrolled and, and their experience was essentially like, welcome, um, here's a little cash payment. Uh, which was equivalent to the incentives we expected people to earn in other conditions. And we said, good luck to you. And that was it. So it was really an empty shell of a condition. Um, all of the researchers who designed experiments in this project could vary a few elements of what happened to the participants in the study. So participants are members of 24-hour fitness gyms. They sign up on a digital uh, platform for this study. I'll show you more about that in a minute. And so researchers could vary the sign-up experience. Like, did they see surveys? Did they get instructions? Did they watch videos? What happened when they're signing up? They could also vary incentives that were offered to people for exercise or for communicating via text throughout the course of the 28-day program that we offered them. 
And they could send people reminders and interactive texts throughout this time. And the reminders were linked to times when people plan to exercise. Um, planning to exercise was another element of most of the treatments, having people make a little schedule of when they would go to the gym. Okay, so actually, in addition to having our placebo control condition that I just mentioned, we also designed sort of a best treatment, uh, or excuse me, a best practices treatment condition that um, was based on past research suggesting you know, we, we pulled ideas from that past research on what we thought would probably be pretty effective to encourage uh, gym attendance. And those tools were things like having people make a plan, choosing the dates and times when they intended to exercise, sending them reminders 30 minutes before those times, and also giving them micro incentives. Um, so we'd give them points that were convertible for Amazon cash. And those points were worth um, an amount that was pretty small. So people are earning about 20 cents per gym visit on average. That's what I'm calling the micro incentives. Okay. And then scientists tested a whole slew of other ideas. And if I walked you through every hypothesis tested, I wouldn't get to tell you anything else. So instead what I've done here is sort of throw up a smattering. I'll tell you about some of the best performers later. So you get a flavor for, um, for this, but to give you a sense, like, you know, they changed everything from the incentives people are into exercise to, um, trying to get people to choose different kinds of physical activity to focus more on fun and efficacy, uh, to, you know, mindset interventions, commitment interventions, really wide range of ideas. So that was exciting. Okay. So study recruitment took place over about 10 months and everyone who was a member of 24 hour fitness was encouraged to register for an exercise program designed by scientists, uh, that would help them build a lasting habit. That was, you know, what we, that was our marketing pitch to the customers and, um, recruitment happened via emails, via in-person we had people in person in gyms up trying to recruit. We had posters up, um, postcards, you know, social media, all the usual channels. And our final sample included almost 63,000 people, um, from all over the U S they were a little skewed female, um, but fairly representative in many ways and not heavy exercisers in the period before our intervention. They were on average going to the gym just a little over one time a month um, in the four weeks leading up to the intervention. And um, just so you could see kind of what it looked like, we tried to build our registration site and our whole customer experience. So it would feel like a real commercial program. You know, we hired a graphics designer to make everything look snazzy. So people would come to a landing page. Most of them use mobile, but some could do it, chose to do it on computers. They learned about the program. They consented to be in the research. That's the terms and conditions. They give us their email, their cell phone number, which we validate that we can actually communicate two ways. And then that's when random assignment happens. And as I mentioned, there's a placebo control group that at that point, when they're randomly assigned, the next thing they're told is, you know, we're going to give you, um, some points that you can convert for Amazon cash at the end of the program, equivalent to, I think we pay them about $1.20, which was roughly what we expected others might earn based on past research over the course of the month. And we said, good luck. And then they didn't hear from us again until the program ended when we said, you know, the program is over. So it was kind of a weird shell program, but that was our placebo. And then other folks mostly saw screens that looked more like this. They'd log in, they're welcome. They're told they can earn rewards uh, for, ex for exercise, roughly what the point conversion is in terms of cash, um, they make plans around their gym visits in most conditions. Then a lot of AB tests were inserted at this point, so extra screens. Um, and finally, uh, they're told, you know, congratulations, you're all set, and here's what's gonna happen for the next 28 days. And over the next 28 days, they get reminders uh, about their workout and they get reinforcement, you know, when, where, whatever researchers designed as the key hypothesis in their study is just being reiterated via text and also via email, which is sent once a week. So that's, that's what it looks like. And I want to just start by showing you um, how our placebo control condition looks over time. And then this is going to be basically the baseline against which I show you a lot of results. So just showing you what that baseline data looks like, I think is helpful. So these are the average weekly visits during the intervention period. Um, they're weighted to ensure sort of smoothing over time so that, you know, if we had a big influx of, um, of signups in August, say August doesn't end up overweighted in our final data, but it actually doesn't matter much that we did that. 
But this is just to show you, you know, these are the pre-intervention data and post. It doesn't look like there's much of a placebo effect. Although again, this is not random assignments just before or after for this particular condition. But you can see that maybe like in the week before someone signs up for this program, they're going through a little bit of an uh, extra enthusiastic phase of exercise that wears off quickly. So maybe that's why they sign up. Okay, so this is the control. And from now on, I'm gonna be showing you treatment effects that are estimated relative to this control. I'll show you both regressions and I'll also show you some graphs where I subtract off this, this control group and show you sort of the remainder from a treatment group. Okay, so this graph I realize is sort of an evil graph to put up because there's so much going on. So let me orient you to it and, and also let you know, I do not expect you or want you to read all of the labels on the y-axis. It will give you a headache. Um, <laughs> this is just a dis I'm trying to show you a distribution of treatment effects that we're estimating across our 53 treatments. So on the x-axis is the estimated treatment effect from a regression, like a giant regression, and I'm plotting each individually estimated treatment effect relative to the placebo control condition with a 95% confidence interval graphed around it. And uh, the, the placebos are holdout, that's the zero line, and that's this gray line here. So you can see actually that compared to placebo, if you look at the blue dots and where they are, um, basically all the blue dots are to the right of the placebo control, meaning like, look, almost everything had a, at least a positive, um, maybe not significant, but at least directionally positive effect. And only one treatment was even like to the left. Uh, and obviously with huge error margins around that. So good. It seems like scientists actually can increase exercise and actually 45% of the treatments outperform the placebo control at a, you know, p-value of 0.05, not adjusting for multiple comparisons there, which is a big red flag. Um, I'll talk, I can talk a little bit more about multiple comparisons in a moment, but here I'm just giving you that distributional knowledge. And of course, you'd expect two and a half percent of treatments in a two-tailed test to outperform the control at random. So the fact that we see 45% uh, means that lots are working and, and we've done lots of tests. You know, you can test to confirm that on average, the treatment effect is positive. Of course it is. Another thing worth saying is that we can test to make sure that the distribution of the treatment effects uh, is meaningful. It's not just sort of noise what, what outperformed the placebo and we can confirm they differ from one another significantly. So that's interesting as well. Um, now here's a little bit uh, other interesting distributional information that's a little less heartening. Um, when we compare how well our treatments perform to the sort of best practices control that we added to our treatment group, which was um, having people make a plan around when they'd visit the gym, giving them reminders to come to the gym 30 minutes before those times and incentivizing them with these small incentives, 20 cents roughly per gym visit, only 9% of our treatments actually outperformed that significantly, which means it was much, much harder to beat right this threshold than the placebo control. Uh, and you know, we can think about why, if anyone wants to get into that, like maybe more ingredients aren't better. Maybe we've captured a lot of the benefits by using these basic ingredients, but, but a few did, right? So 9% is more than two and a half percent you'd expect by chance. And it is significant if you do a test of that. Okay. I want to tell you about a few top performers before moving on. The first um, best treatment that we discovered from doing this study, uh, and of course the you know the few top performers are indistinguishable statistically from each other, but I'll still prioritize the top few just so you get a sense of what really popped as working. Um, offering people a small bonus to return after a missed workout was our best performer. And uh, what this means is we're trying to keep people from missing multiple planned visits. So say you plan to go on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and you miss Thursday, uh, instead of earning 20 cents as usual, if you go on Friday after your missed visit, you could earn a whole 29 cents. So, you know, not enough money that you'd skip, I think, a gym visit strategically to get that extra bonus. I think it's more of a psychological effect that we're uh, giving you a reason not to miss multiple scheduled visits in a row. So trying to prevent falling off the wagon. And that was the psychological principle behind this idea that was led by um, John Bashirs from Harvard Business School is that um, a streak of misses might be really detrimental. If we can get people back after just one miss, that might be valuable. And that increased gym visits 27%. Um, and here's just what, what that looks like uh, in the data. If you subtract off the placebo and look at the before, you can see you know, a nice bump right when the treatment begins. Um, and that decline is not statistically significant or robust because we actually have, anyway, two of the top five performers did 
use this treatment with slightly different sizes of the bonus and the other doesn't show the downward uh, that downward trend. Um, this is a boring treatment, but it was the second best, which is kind of reassuring, like, oh, things make sense. Um, in one of our controls, actually, people were just paid a lot more per gym visit. They were paid almost $2 instead of 20 cents. Paying people more to go to the gym, that works too. Um, though interestingly, not, you know, not any better than this tiny nine cent bonus for the return after a missed visit. And here's just a little sense of how that looks in the data and the raw data. Okay, the final one I'll mention was designed by Bob Cialdini, uh, who of course has been a pioneer in thinking about social pressure and social norms and how that changes our decisions. And he designed a treatment that uh, let people know that Americans are exercising more than ever before and pulled data showing these trends where exercise is not only a norm, but it's on the upswing and um, reinforced that throughout the 28 days with text messages that, you know, everybody's doing it. It's a fad, it's growing in popularity and that grew in its strength though, again, not significantly so, but it's kind of fun to see the growth uh, trend, even if we can't say it's meaningful. Okay, let me turn to prediction accuracy though. I'm realizing I see a little bit in chat. Um, so let me pause a second to look at that. Um, Michael is asking, are there any generalizations or insights you can make about how age influenced or impacted treatment efficacy? That's a great question. Thanks for asking it, Michael. One of the things that I, as I mentioned earlier, I was so excited about with this huge sample and all these different treatments, the ability we'd have to, to look at heterogeneous treatment effects to tailor and say like, what's best for whom? We actually have some great machine learning researchers who have took on that question. And I will just say, it is amazing how little we are finding that's systematic and different about what works best for whom. Um, age does not see, you know, there aren't like, there aren't big effects where older versus younger folks respond differently to these treatments. Um, I thought, you know, people who are heavy exercisers before versus light exercisers, that that might be a big differentiator, maybe race, maybe geography, we really aren't seeing it. So um, that in itself is surprising, interesting, and, um, you know, we're continuing to dig in. And I should say, um, Rahul Landia, who is a professor at the University of Michigan, is working on a paper right now about like how much better could you do in targeting the treatments if you use machine learning? And the answer is rather than just like, you know, give everyone the best performer, the answer is a little better, but not nearly as much as I would have expected. Um, I think I see a hand, Hong Yi or- Yep. Hi, thank you. Uh, so hopefully I didn't miss this part at the beginning because I, I did come in a bit late, but how do we think about multiple, multiple hypothesis testing corrections in this scenario? Because I guess you're doing different populations and doing very different experiments. So is that enough to sort of mitigate the fact that there might be multiple hypothesis testing issues? No, it's a fantastic question. I only talked about it a tiny bit to say that um, it's important to worry about. So uh, there are many different ways you could do this. And um, so far, what I've shown you is just uncorrected data where we're sort of relying on distributional properties to say like, okay, if 45% of tests are significant with no correction and 2.5% should be by chance, we know we're, you know, seeing something real and we can do like F tests to confirm that. But actually in our more recent mega studies, we've been using various different, so, and, and in this per first paper that's coming out in Nature, we just present all the uncorrected means and standard errors and we're like, use your own preferred correction. Obviously this needs to be corrected. The top performers that I've highlighted, like they're so wildly significant that even the most conservative correction doesn't touch them. Um, but we've started using, you know, we, we presented Q values in one of our recent papers. Um, we brought on some statisticians to like help us think about what are the best corrections and they keep changing their mind on which they like the best. So we've actually presented multiple different ways, but the good news is really that, um, you know, the top performers in every mega study I'll present, they survive these kinds of corrections. And of course the things that are like right around statistical significance without a correction fall below. Um, but, but distributionally we see like, okay, these tools work. And when we do these big studies, of course, we need to do multiple correction before. And I guess the other thing I would say about it is, I think an even bigger issue than just the p-values is understanding what to make of the actual effect size estimates. Because when you have a distribution like this, you're going to overestimate the best performers. And of course, you're going to like 
underestimate the worst performers in a sense, uh, just, you know, the winner's curse. So I think actually that is in some ways a bigger challenge. And again, in our more recent papers on vaccination, we've even tried to estimate like by how much do we think the top performer is overestimated and what's a more reasonable expectation if you tried to replicate for the effect size you might see. So it's stuff we're actively thinking about. And I think the main thing is just like, you know, big warning lights. We are doing multiple hypothesis testing. You can't just like assume if you get one significant result at 0.05, like, wow, we found something important, but that's not what we're doing. So hopefully um, we're not doing anything too, you know, I see. And, and, and I'm guessing these are all different like subgroups of the larger population. So you would have to sort of- um, No, they're not. Account. That's sort of the, that is the okay. methodology is this was random assignment. And so- um, Sorry, right, that's trial. what I mean. Like random yeah, subgroups. Yeah, so it's their yeah, comparable. Random subgroups. Yeah. So like, I guess the only point of non-comparability would be the selection into the treatment, right? So like some treatments, might garner some kind of higher selection into it, whereas other ones, sorry, not, well, not we, selection, we but like intent assignment, to like- So the people don't have any choice in what treatment they get. So, as in more like follow through, that's what I mean, as in like adoption of the treatment. It's all itself. intent to treat. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so everything I'm presenting is intent to treat. If somebody doesn't, that's one of the beauties of the gym as our outcome, because you can measure people's gym attendance. Like there's no, there's no self-report, it's just, do they come? And if somebody doesn't ever show up, they're a zero uh, every week. So mm -hmm. everything's intent to treat and there's no selection issues. Perfect. I think that's super important. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Um, I'm, I love dialogue, so I appreciate that. Okay, so prediction accuracy. So if we could predict, uh, if we had these 53 proposed treatments and we knew in advance which was gonna be the best and the worst, we wouldn't need to spend all this money to do a big trial, right? We just like run the best one. So we think prediction accuracy is, is a useful thing to understand when it comes to this kind of mega study. And um, so we did a few trials to look at prediction accuracy. I'm going to just um, pool and show you basically um, we had different populations, you know, lay people, public health professors who study exercise, behavioral science practitioners, they made thousands of predictions and the correlation between their predicted effect size and treatment effect size was zero. Um, total inability to predict is sort of like the headline here. The other thing that's a headline is if you look at the axis labels here, you'll notice that they're out of whack. And that is because actual treatment effects were vastly smaller than predicted treatment effects. So people were wildly overconfident about how much we would increase exercise with the interventions we showed them. Um, they were more wildly overconfident, the less familiar they were with behavioral science but all the groups were, were vastly um, miscalibrated on this. So that I think is interesting and important to know as well. Um, we did not like think to do this perfectly before we ran our study, but we did ask each team scientist before they got data back to make a prediction about whether or not their hypothesis would be supported and what, like, what the size of the intervention effect would be. And there was no correlation there either between uh, you know, what scientists thought would happen in their studies and what actually happened. So scientists were not calibrated either. Okay, let's see. Um, Dunning-Kruger, yes, maybe, maybe Dunning-Kruger. And uh, gender differences, sorry, I didn't mention gender differences. We also don't see any interesting gender differences in our results. So um, very, again, just very little heterogeneity here or in the study I'm gonna show you next. So let me conclude this and get to a little data on flu vaccination where I think I think arguably the benefits of what we've done are even higher for society, though I, I'm really proud of this first study. I think of it as more like a demonstration project that we can do this kind of science. And then it motivated subsequent work we did during the pandemic to try to understand um, rapidly with large samples and lots of ideas, what were the best candidates for messages that might encourage vaccination. So in this, this first study, just key takeaways, a lot of things worked, which is great and at pretty low marginal cost. They didn't increase gym attendance by, you know, orders of magnitude, but nine to 27%, which nothing to sneeze at for 75% cents a person um, and survive multiple hypothesis testing. We would have done a terrible job at launching just one or two studies. We just predicted our favorites from, from what was submitted ex ante. So that does to me suggest this kind of work is worth doing in, at least in cases where we think there's a lot of policy value in, in learning what's best. Um, another thing I didn't mention, but I'll just flag is we didn't see much enduring change when we ended our program after four weeks and then looked subsequently at gym attendance, only 8% of interventions produced any statistically meaningful change in the post intervention period. So in aggregate, it's there, it's significantly more than you'd see by chance, but it's kind of puny. 
Um, uh, most of the sort of treatment effects, they basically decline, but to about 30% of their during treatment strength, just in the four weeks after, which is totally comparable to what past habit formation research has seen. So I don't think we're finding anything like an outlier in this work about um, carryover effects, but just not super impressive. We had small-ish treatment effects at this low cost to begin with. And then when they decay further over time, there's not a lot left. Okay, so the negative studies that came next were motivated by the pandemic. And you know we'd done this work, trying to figure out how to use this new methodology. We'd been thinking maybe we'd turn it on vaccination. And in March, 2020, we were like, wow, we could really get out in front of a challenge that's coming if we did some mega studies in fall 2020 before COVID vaccines are ready. Um, we decided we would look at nudging flu shots in this context with the hope that we could ask scientists to build interventions they thought would also be portable and useful for COVID-19. And then whatever our best candidates were could be sort of like raced over to, uh, to use and testing um, with COVID-19 vaccines. And I'll just preview for anyone who's skeptical that the sort of best performer that's gonna rise to the top in these studies was validated uh, as a useful tool to combat, or not combat, but to, to encourage COVID-19 vaccination. Um, my former student, who I'm so proud of, Heng Chen Dai, an amazing professor at UCLA Anderson, and um, Sylvia Sicardo from Carnegie Mellon led studies that use sort of our best performer. And uh, with thousands of people, a paper published in Nature earlier this fall showed that the best performers I'm about to show you against flu were useful in encouraging COVID vaccination. So. That's the end of the story, but now let me tell you the middle of the story. Um, first study we launched was with uh, two local health systems, Penn Medicine and Geisinger. They have millions of patients. And the idea was we wanted to encourage patients who had a new or routine primary care appointment in the fall of 2020 um, at either, you know, with either of these health systems to accept a vaccine when it was offered to them by their care provider. And every care provider always offers a vaccine against the flu at these visits, but many are declined. So the experimental design involved patients being randomly assigned to one of 20 different messaging conditions, and their condition would determine which messages people receive via text in the three days leading up to their appointment. So we're trying to communicate about the flu vaccine before your doctor's appointment so that when the doctor offers it to you in person, you'll say, yes, I want it. And I should note that um, this is on top of the usual care. So the control condition is also getting text reminders, but they're just focused on the appointment and we're layering on text reminders about flu shots. So um, the sample is about 50,000 people, a little bit skewed female again, and uh, the prior year, about half of them had gotten vaccinated, roughly the national average. And in our control group in this population, which gets just usual care, they're offered a vaccine, but they don't get texts in advance about the vaccine. Their texts are just about their doctor's appointment. Those folks get vaccinated 42% of the time. Okay. So again, don't try to read everything on the y-axis or you'll get dizzy, but what I'm doing again here is showing you a distribution of estimated treatment effects where that dotted line is the usual care control. And I'm estimating the benefits of each of the text messages tested relative to that. And uh, distributionally, again, I, we can confirm the hypothesis that, you know, first of all, everything's right of the treatment. So like the text messages work, just pooling all of this, we get a significant benefit from text reminders. And then if we want to sort of zoom in on, on what are the things that outperform the most to suggest ideas to policymakers, an interesting pattern emerges where the two top performers in this messaging treatment both involve multiple texts um, and both used language saying a flu shot had been reserved for you and none of the other messages use that language. So that is interesting, we think, and I'll show you more evidence for why, why it seems encouraging. So this is just you know, 72 hours before, very standard message, you have an appointment, and then um, you know, it's reserved for you. This flu vaccine has been reserved for you, sort of ownership language. Quickly, because I know we're short on time, Basically, this ended up being a replication that we didn't expect it to be, and we tested different ideas. We did another mega study with Walmart pharmacies trying to encourage their uh, customers to come in and get a flu vaccine during the fall 2020 flu season. Um, so this is a different decision. Instead of accepting a vaccine when you see a doctor who offers it to you, you have to like get in your car, drive to the pharmacy, ask for a flu vaccine. But um, at any rate, we're going to see very similar results. 
So these participants were customers who'd previously gotten a flu vaccine with Walmart. That was for legal reasons and is a limitation for sure. They were assigned to one of 23 study conditions. And actually there wasn't much overlap. We had a separate tournament to decide what the messaging would be about. And I should have said a little more about all the things tested, but you know, in both there, there's a wide range of ideas from like, dedicate your flu shot to a loved one, get your vaccine to protect other people you care about, get a vaccine because everybody else is doing it. Here's a joke about the flu. Um, or have you heard the one about the flu? Don't spread it around trying to like give you an earbug. So all really different ideas and different things were tested in these two settings. Um, these folks get one or two text messages in September, right when people are starting to think about getting flu vaccines and for three days after that. And here we have almost 700,000 people in our study. And again, a little bit female, but fairly representative. The vaccination rate in the control group is about 30%. But of course, we're not observing vaccines received outside of Walmart, which is a major limitation. So here we have huge statistical power and we actually can say every single treatment outperformed the control and any correction you do, you know, you still get that result. So um, text messages are good. And the key things that jump out of this one is actually the top two performers in this um, treatment in this study as well, use very similar language. We weren't allowed to say reserve for you because Walmart was nervous about that language. We ended up in a couple of studies of saying a flu shot was waiting for you and that rose to the top as well. So this ownership language, it's waiting for you sort of default, like recommend, maybe a recommendation is applied. Otherwise, why would we have reserved it or had it waiting for you? Um, it's probably gonna be hassle-free. That's winning in, in both trials. Um, and also multiple, messages did better than a single message on average. So nagging seems to work. Here's our top performer. I should also say another thing we sort of noticed across analyses done of the attributes of the winning messages in both studies is that um, when, when things were casual or interactive and sort of felt unusual in terms of raters saying like, I wouldn't expect to get a message like this from my doctor's office, those kinds of messages tend to underperform. And the top performers are like very, very clinical just really simple messages repeatedly telling you, you know, hey, it's us, you can get this vaccine and remember it's waiting for you or it's reserved for you. Okay, so let me wrap up here and see if we have time for a couple of questions. Um, my key takeaways, we definitely found evidence that behavioral science could help nudge vaccine adoption, both during primacy, primary care visits and pharmacies. Uh, this reserve for you, waiting for you language seems really promising. And as I mentioned, has now been proven to be useful when uh, encouraging COVID-19 vaccination as well. Um, and congruency and multiple message seems important. Um, Anirudh, I'm just going to wait one second and finish that. I'm going to come to you if that's okay. Okay, cool. Um, okay, last slide. My big conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that mega studies have the potential to accelerate scientific discovery. We feel really great about what we were able to do during the pandemic. Um, they give us this ability to compare apples to apples, reduce fixed costs of the work and the risk to individual researchers of taking on such a massive project um, and maybe of testing a wild idea. And they can facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration. And I think they lead to policy recommendations that are a lot better than what we generate based on scientific intuition. And I should say, again, we didn't see great predictive power when we did some predictions with those flu shot mega studies, though they were a little, they were a tiny bit better when we looked at lay people, um, but not very good at predicting what would rise to the top. Um, they do have limitations, not perfect, right? They're very complex and costly to implement. So every lab around the world can't just do a mega study. You need big grants and staff. So we have to decide it's an important enough problem to support this and fund it. Um, and they require really big sample sizes, centralized coordination. Final thing I just wanna say, we talked about a little already, thanks to Hong Yi, is that the effects of the top performing interventions are also almost certainly overestimated, which if we don't correct and clarify so that people have proper expectations could be a problem. Okay, so let me stop. And um, Anirudh, am I saying your name right? I would love to hear your question. Oh. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, so I, I like this idea a lot. Um, I'm not 100% I understand how you're being able to rank order um, or sort of, well, rank order perhaps, but um, your, your standard errors for the average treatment effects are all overlapping. Those are ninety five percent confidence intervals. I should say I only present. Ah, uh, those are so 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 those are not the standard errors. 
Those are all, everything I showed you was a 95% confidence interval. So they're very wide. Standard errors would be tighter, but absolutely okay. the top. I think I mentioned this when I was talking about gems, but I should have said it again when I was talking about, um, you know, the, the top one versus the number four. Right. Indistinguishable, right? In almost all of these studies, maybe the Walmart study, we had the power to do a little bit better than that. But, but it's more that, um, you know, if I'm going to make a point estimate about what I would advance I would take the best performer and say like, that's the thing that, you know, we have the best prediction now would be useful, but uh, it would be completely absurd for me to say, you know, number one versus number three are going to yield hugely different results. But, but, you know, as a Bayesian and I didn't have strong priors, right. In fact, I didn't really have almost any priors. Um, I would always recommend the top performer be what we then launch the next time. That's so essentially, um, you, it's it's pretty much between the top performer and say like so so yeah I guess that's what I'm trying to uh, how much distinguishing can you get and then how does that so that just increases the number of comparisons you have now between each treatment and all the other treatments right so we're some of that we're doing visually we're just but that's essentially a statistical test when you're when you're plotting those things right that's so at right some, at some point that number of tests explodes right because yeah, you're absolutely. essentially comparing so you, you each do all treatment. sorts of different corrections depending on what. Uh, comparisons you want to make, right? So um, what we've mostly been doing in our uh, papers to date, and, and we could debate whether this is really the right thing to do, but we're, um, we're correcting for the sort of like all the comparisons against the control. Um, and then you'd have to do a different kind of correction if you want to do those in between comparisons. Um, when I'm advocating for like, if I want to talk to a policymaker and say like, I think you should use this when you're going to deploy something, I'm not saying to them because it significantly outperforms everything else. I'm saying to them, that's my best estimate. And I think that's justified, right? Like that, that's what the data says is the best performer. That's our best guess. But to be able to say like, I can differentiate it and say it outperforms however many others, there are different tests you need to do there. We actually do in the paper, the nature paper that's coming out next week for every treatment we set, we have like a list where we're like, what fraction of other treatments does it significantly outperform? Um, just to like kind of give a sense and, you know, maybe that's informative. I think there's lots of different ways you could descriptively think about what's most useful to me. I think what's most useful is understanding the distribution of what we can accomplish, like sort of understanding distributionally, what are the kinds of effect size we see with these kinds of treatments, knowing that on average they're outperforming control, um, knowing what the top performer is so we can make a recommendation seems useful. And then. I do feel like we're getting convergent validity in the mega studies on vaccination, which makes me more confident about like these things that are rising to the top. And then there have now been some follow-up studies to just test those or even dive into mechanism. There's a PhD student at UCLA named John Bogart, who basically took this idea of sort of reserve for you, waiting for you. And in his dissertation work, ran a series of six studies to try to understand why does that work? Does it work in lots of other settings? What he's landed upon is that it's very robust and it seems to be driven by um, an exclusivity perception. Um, so, so I think it's sort of more, hopefully the mega study points us in intriguing directions and then that follow-up work can do a better job validating. Um, I hope that's helpful. Great, thank you. I, I would like to, I, I think this is a very interesting study, but there's one thing, particularly given your Thaler Sunstein reference that concerns me. This research seems to be about what's the best nudge, what's the most efficacious nudge versus how I interpreted the book and I think how is a good way to interpret the book, what kind of choice architectures represent the best and fairest and most equitable way of getting better outcomes. For example, you could have asked, what kind of messages do you want to receive, et cetera? So I just want clarity from you about, was this a, what's my best nudge versus how should we rethink in a, in a multi uh, uh, mega study context, what choice architectures should mean for public policy? Because they really are different things. I, I totally agree with you. They're totally different things. And what we're doing here is sort of optimization within a constrained opportunity right. set, right? right? Which is really different than like, you know, if I wanted to say, what's the best way to change the way we, you know, the way we make vaccination appointments available or, right. um, you know, uh, provide free transportation, it, you know, we're, we're in a very constrained set and trying to optimize in that, um, in that 
setting for what it's worth from um, my interactions with folks in nudge units. This is the world they're mostly working in when they're trying to do nudge work. I wish it weren't because I think it limits their impact. But most of the time they're told like, here's a mailing. Can you optimize it for us so that we can get as many people as possible to pay their parking tickets? Um, Or, you know, we're going to do a text messaging campaign to try to encourage vaccination. Can you optimize it? So unfortunately, I think this is a lot of what behavioral science units and government are doing, but I'm completely on board that there would be bigger opportunities and I'd love to see less optimization and more reinvention of choice architecture. Just what I was looking for clarity on. Thank you very much. I'm not sure what I am available, but I also, I remembered somebody said something about five minutes and I, if I'm breaking norms that I should, we should wrap, I can do that or I can hang out for four more minutes and look at all the. That's why choice architectures are so important. The default should not be that you go away immediately. (laughs) I'm happy to hang out, but maybe I should say like, if anyone else needs to leave, I won't be offended. Um, Let's see. I'm looking at the chat. Um, Nando asked, in terms of number of messages, do you see an inflection point where more messages drive less expected behavior? Um, We just see that more messages drive more vaccination, but I don't know what unexpected behavior would be in this context, because we're really only measuring that one outcome. Uh, And we don't have a wide range of number of messages because maybe you won't be surprised to hear that, you know, a major retailer like Walmart wasn't willing to let us message people 10 times. There was a pretty tight constraint. They were like, okay, you can bug them once initially. If they respond, because we did an interactive text, you can like keep a conversation flowing back and forth. And then you can bother them one more time, sort of like, even if you haven't heard back from them ever. And again, start a conversation that can go on but uh, we couldn't nag them like once a week or anything along those lines. I know there's some really cool work by Arez Ueli and Dave Rand, two uh, colleagues of yours on nudging through text reminders, people to be compliant with their tuberculosis um, treatments where they were able to nag even more and saw really big benefits, but, but we could only take it so far. Um, Mariam is saying the, the variable costs of different interventions. Um, maybe that's a question about, I'm presenting only treatment effect sizes, but I haven't taken cost into account really so much in what I've presented today. And I do think that is really important. And I, I've even written a paper about sort of the importance of doing the actual cost analysis when you're, when you're designing nudges and choosing what to pick. For the text messages, basically the cost is essentially the same for all of them, but it was a bigger, it's a bigger issue with the gym study where there were different incentives being thrown around and the, that cost benefit analysis is important too. Sorry, in terms of outcomes, um, so you mentioned earlier how like psychologists and economists have different you know, journals to submit to. Have you seen what the outcomes are in terms of publication for these papers? Like do yeah, you see them all great, great sort question. of using the same study submitting to different um, Yeah, so there's, um, one paper that was published about a sub study that I'm, I guess I'm co-author on probably all of them if they come come to fruition. We have one sub sub study sort of pre-registered independently that's published in Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, which is like a sort of an OB journal or a judgment decision making journal. And then this forthcoming paper at Nature, um, those are for the gym study. And other teams have not chosen to write up into so far their own independent results, though maybe they will. I hope some will, but they're sort of on their own on that. They have the data and we leave it to them. The um, mega studies on vaccination are still fairly fresh data. One paper is under review at um, JAMA Internal Medicine about a specific pre-registered sub-study. And I know others are in preparation for marketing journals. So we are seeing some differentiation in, in the outlet preferences for the those sub studies awesome so i think uh we're coming up on the hour i think i'm going to just wrap it up here and just make a couple of announcements so next week december 2nd we have avi goldfar from the university of toronto presenting and thank you so much katie this was awesome thank you for having me this was super fun and thanks for the great questions i really enjoyed the dialogue and the opportunity Mm -hmm. so thanks for the amazing community
and for um, inviting me to be a part of it. Hope to see you again in the future. Likewise. See ya. <laughs>